everybody. Good. So, how about a big round of applause for the Pot Camp team? They did an amazing job. Great, great. My name is John Pachana, and I'm here to talk about the intersection of three things entertainment, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Those are the three streams that kind of feed this discussion. So, um, yeah, welcome to the Innovating Entertainment talk today. Can everybody hear me, or is this breaking up? That's good. Looking good? Good. Okay, so uh, this is the Innovating Entertainment presentation, Music Road 2.0, how Nashville keeps the title, the music city in the new music world that we live in now. All right, so, so I, there's four buckets that we're gonna, we're gonna look at here. We're gonna look back and look at three eras of entertainment innovation. We're gonna look around and look at some data points of uh, the last four or five years. And we're gonna look in and kind of see where each of us fit into this, what I call an innovation matrix. Because um, everybody here is a knowledge worker, whether they're in technology or entertainment or development. Um, so it's important to really take a high level view. We're gonna back up to about 50,000 feet and really be intellectually honest about where we fit into this ecosystem. And then we're gonna look forward and try to answer the question of why now is the best time to be innovating within, specifically, within the entertainment space. And then we're gonna to try to save a few minutes for Q&A at the end. All right, so a little bit about myself. My name's John Pichotta. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Music Sync, which is a licensing accelerator platform for copyright owners, currently testing and limited preview. Uh, also uh, help a company called Blue Art Capital out of Atlanta as their entrepreneur in residence. Managing partner at Ripcord Entertainment. Uh, we are focused on building future facing media companies. Some of our credits uh, American Music Awards, Song of the Year, Video of the Year nomination. Um, and we also organize a monthly meetup called Innovation Group Nashville, which um, is the first Thursday of each month, which everybody's invited to. We meet at the Entrepreneur Center. Um, and kind of the DNA for that meetup is, is really sharing. Uh, companies that have launched and are scaling, kind of sharing their their hindsight is the next batch of companies' foresight. So we get together and talk about how they've won, how they've fumbled, kind of their experiences in a non-solicitous environment. Um, so you're, everybody's invited to be a part of that as well. All right, so just to set the context for where we find ourselves, the interviewer asks, what do you think is the biggest problem plaguing the music business right now? And the manager answers, a lack of understanding that we are no longer in a music business. All right, so let's, let's repeat that again. The biggest problem isn't digital downloads or peer-to-peer -peer networks. The biggest problem is a misunderstanding that we're still in the music business. So this is the world that we find ourselves in. So this, this is the context and kind of the trajectory of the conversation, which leads to a reset in the entertainment space. All right, so before we look forward, I want to look back and look at three different eras of entertainment innovation. The first era uh, is the physical experience only. This is the opera house, this is the jazz club, this is the chitlin circuit, where you physically heard the music and that was really the only option. Uh, and there are a couple of options of sheet music and player pianos. For the most part, it was the physical experience only. Era two, I call the Walkman era. This is the innovation that came out of the industrial age. It was driven by two things, primarily, physical product and radio. This is the previous model. Uh, kind of platinum records and top 40 were kind of the metrics points for that. And it had a real high view of creativity and kind of a low view of innovation. And we're gonna unpack that in a second. Uh, the process was very repeatable. You make the record, you tour the record, you write the record, and you repeat, repeat the process. Uh, but we're enter where we are now is we're entering a third grand era for entertainment innovation, which is a really rare opportunity historically. Uh, this is uh, a, a couple of thoughts here. This is structural, not cyclical change for the global entertainment media industry. Uh, in some ways, this could be called the perfect storm. The previous two eras 
We're built for an unconnected world. We are now entering into a more and more connected space, which is a great opportunity for companies with smart ideas that can execute and build the next great company. Uh, so let's look around. This um, a couple a couple data points that uh, that I think are, are interesting. Music is the most popular category on YouTube, counting for 31 percent of all views. Most of it is unmonetized. 11 billion videos streamed last month in the U.S. Live streaming is up 600 percent. Live Nation promoted 3 percent more concerts in 2010 versus the previous year and sold 16 percent less tickets. And some of this was the economy, to be sure. And an interesting point is that half of the world is under 25. And why is that important? Because half of the world are digital natives, and they are growing up with the iPhone as their kind of first gadget, where some of us, it might have been the Mac 512 or the Mac Plus, whatever it was. The iPhone, the iPads are, are common to uh, digital natives. And again, the previous industry was built for an unconnected world. We are now more and more in a connected space. And there's kind of two schools of thought that have kind of become uh, kind of the two, two different ways of thinking about this. You usually find, which I call the romantic and the revolutionary. Uh, the romantic romanticizes the past. Okay, He's, his mantra is everything new sucks and if we could just get back to 20 years ago, everybody would be happy. This obviously isn't a sustainable model. He believes the past is always better than the future. The revolutionary, on the other hand, believes that everything should be free. Uh, kind of their mantra is record labels are evil, and if we could just get all the record labels to go the way of the dinosaurs, then music would be free. Uh, kind of the conversation, if you take this and overlay it into a real estate model, you know, hey, I really like your house you built, but I think I should have it, and you're wrong for saying I shouldn't have it. Uh, which, of course, is irrational, but it's a very popular mode of thought. So real estate is a lot like music copyrights. Some are very valuable copyrights, and some are not. Uh, so what we believe in our companies, and we talk about this all the time, both these are incorrect. You can't really romanticize the past and not innovate into the future. And you can't, uh, free isn't really a sustainable business model. Uh, so what we talk about is a third way that doesn't deny the heavy lifting of innovation. The third way, what we talk about has deep domain experiences. They can see around corners. They're usually led by vision rather than committee. They have a bias towards action. They take the best parts of the previous model and innovate them forward. Uh, they're able to think like an owner and ultimately trust the future. Okay, this is a this is a thought that is is worth noting. The ability to process change and even better to drive change in the entertainment ecosystem is now the golden goose. So as technology speeds up, the ability to drive change around smart visions and smarter models is very valuable. Uh, so my thesis is this, is that innovation is the new black. And what I mean by that is, unknowingly, creativity has harmed the entertainment space. Or maybe better yet, a hyper-focus or dependence on creativity is no longer adequate. Innovation is the new normal for any entertainment city, and in a sense, has to be reintroduced into the ecosystem. So we're going to look at the kind of the difference between creativity and innovation in a minute. But we're, we're in Nashville, right? We're Music City. It's in our DNA. Well, kind of. I mean, we, we, are, we are Music City, but it's our belief that if Nashville plays by an outdated rule book of the Garth Brooks era, that doesn't work going forward. So in a sense, if we don't innovate, we have the high potential of no longer being considered Music City. <coughs> a friend of mine who um, went to visit iTunes about two years after their launch, he was, he was expecting to see you know, 30 guys in a four-story office. 
And when he got there, there were three guys in the corner of an office at Apple. That was iTunes. And these three guys dismantled and innovated and disrupted a very important income stream for the entertainment space. I'm not saying they're wrong, I'm just saying the small group of people with vision can do an amazing amount of, of work as a team. So, and it's kind of ironic that we're down here at uh, on Lower Broad, but it's our belief that as, as great as Tootsie's is, and I have nothing against Tootsie's, uh, but this is this is not enough to, to keep the title of Music City. We have to we have to innovate way beyond Tootsie's Orchid Lounge. Uh, the British publication The Economist had this to say that innovation is now recognized as the single most important ingredient in any modern economy. All right, uh, has anybody read any Richard Florida books? Couple, couple good. Highly recommend uh, specifically one book, The Rise of the Creative Class. And he studies cities with creative economies and how their thinking uh, really builds strong cities. He, he believes that Nashville is the Silicon Valley of music. And in a sense, he's right. Our, our creative DNA is, is unbelievable. But it's, it's our belief that, that we have to innovate beyond that. So, so now I want to look at a balance between creativity and innovation. Okay? In the previous era, kind of the, uh, the uh, hit radio and product world of the last 80 years kind of looked like this. It had a real high view of creativity and a kind of a tiny sliver of innovation. And the innovation was kind of like 12.1 surround sound for, you know, 20 people, or maybe, maybe into that. Um, so kind of, kind of the creative, and how I define a creative slice of that pie, it, it looks like this. You, you write the record, you record the record, you book the tour and you, you go out and rock. And, as, and then you rinse and repeat that whole process. Okay? And that worked. And that, that is still an important part of where we are today in, in the current model. The, the current model looks like this, where it's more of a balance between the creative side of it and the innovative side. And the innovative side of the pie here is the new white spaces that have become available for teams who can execute and build around smart ideas, okay? All that's very important. The touring, the writing, the production side of it, that will never go away. Those are the kind of non-digitally duplicatable experiences of seeing an artist. When you see Taylor Swift or Kings of Leon, it's like that's, you, you can't bottle that, that personal interaction. All right, so kind of the poster child for uh, the previous model, I would kind of point to Clive Davis. Founder of Arista, great record man. Um, and kind of the poster child for the new world would be Mark Andreessen, founder of Netscape, founder of Name, um, partner at Andreessen Horowitz Venture Capital Fund. And so the forward thinking CEO, I believe, is, is kind of a combination of these two. And you'll pardon the, uh, the amazing Photoshop work that I did. But uh, <laughs> this, this is kind of a, a mashup of the two. And as I was looking at this, I was going, you know what? It kind of looks like the guy from the Goonies. <laughs> a little bit. But uh, anyway, I hope Mark Andreessen's not watching this. So, all right, so why is, the, that's all real, that's, that's interesting thinking, but how does it apply to me? All of us are knowledge workers, whether we work in the publishing world, record label world, development, marketing, where do I fit in this, in this landscape? So what, what, we, what we're gonna look at is a two by two matrix. In the bottom left, we have what I call the shiny objects. And we're gonna drill down on each of these. Shiny objects, and then up and to the left, we have the creative geniuses, okay? And bottom right, we have what I call asset collectors. And up and to the right, the most valuable water, those are the scalable innovations, okay? So let's do a drill down on each of these. Let's look at the shiny objects. These are kind of the hobbyists. The, they're drinking the Kool-Aid, kind of tech enthusiasts. Uh, 
fanboys, hobbyists, kind of bleeding edge early adopters. But these people rarely execute. Okay? Up until the right, we find the creative geniuses. These are the, uh, the producers, the musicians, the SEO, the developers, the technicians, if you will. They're the focused knowledge workers who do the behind the scenes heavy lifting. Very valuable to an entertainment ecosystem. And all, all four of these are, are important to an ecosystem. But we're going to look at the scalable innovations as the most valuable. They're usually hired guns that usually do work for hire. So when they work on something, they usually don't own any, any portion of it. And if they start businesses, they're usually service-based businesses. Uh, like I said, they create, usually don't own, and uh, kind of in a sense, they own a job, okay? So the asset collector quadrant, these are uh, labels and publishers. They kind of build a critical mass within their content. It's a hit-driven model. Um, they own, they usually don't create, they usually hire the creative geniuses to do the work. Uh, and this is, this is the quadrant that kind of led the previous era, okay? But up and to the right, we're going to look at the scalable innovations. These are the new areas that have become available in the last three, four, five years. Um, these are the companies that are creating the next ASCAP, the next Perry Fox, the next Clear Channels of the world. These are better, faster, and smarter companies with global reach that put an emphasis on their team rather than individual talent. Okay, these are the companies that are changing the world. Their team is usually small, but their user base is global. Their reach is, is global. Uh, this is the high risk, high reward category. They're going after big problems. Um, these are the new white spaces that 10 years ago were not available, okay? So, Steve Jobs had this to say, that innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower. And uh, it's an interesting, interesting thought. So all of these are important to an entertainment ecosystem, but not all are valuable. Whereas the scalable innovation can be sold for 30, 40 million dollars, a creative genius can't sell anything, okay? Um, so the, the point, the part of what I'm asking you is, if you are in any of these other quadrants, if you're in the shiny objects quadrant, and you've got an opportunity to move up and to the right, I want to encourage you to do so. If you're a creative genius and you have that deep domain experience and you've got an opportunity to be part of building the next fill in the blank, go for it. Because there's the field the field has, has been leveled in a lot of sin, in a lot of ways. So let's let's take a second. I mean, there's been kind of the first generation of successful profitable, innovative companies to come out of Nashville. And these are, these are a few of them. Um, some of our friends, and you may, you may know uh, a handful of these people. The three things we talk about within our companies are, you know, each company needs to do each of these. We need to change the world in some way. We need to create value for the owners, the, the shareholders, uh, and have fun in the process. We don't want to change the world and, have value and create value and just be miserable at work. And we don't want to have fun and change the world and not be creating something that is increasing, the value is increasing. So th these are part of the, the three kind of touch points that are important to, to our companies. And, um, and what this asks of you is to really be a part of an adventure that can change, that can change the world. You can do work like you've never done before, to be proud of what you create, to think like an owner, and to build something you will fight for every day, um, and to do the best work of your career, or your career so far. So in closing, what I want to leave with you is all that we have been or done is in the past. And the future starts today. And if you have the opportunity to build something that you own and that can scale, 
I really want to encourage you to leave, leave the nest of comfortability, that's a word, and to take that, that step into moving to the up and to the right column of scalable innovations. So with that, thank you for coming, and I just want to open up for questions. Yeah.